Welcome to lecture 12 in hermeneutics. Um, I'm in beautiful Juneau, Alaska. I wish I could do this outside, but unfortunately it's raining out there. Um, so uh, sorry you have to just put up with the ugly yellow light inside of this hotel room. It's the best I can do. Um, so today uh, we're taking up a very important subject in our hermeneutical study um, with re relationship to um, what happened at Samaria in Acts chapter 8. And it's going to be pretty much dealing with the baptismal formula um, to some degree. Uh, we may actually stop and, and uh, reference some commentaries here because we're going to deal with, in this particular um, lecture, some verses of scripture that pose um, some serious contradictions. And, you know, of course, for the sake of time, we're going to we're going to have to be brief, uh, but we're going to do our very best uh, to get through most of this. So once again, the topic here is baptism. This is a, and only I'm only dealing with a summary right now because it's just simply not possible for me to take you through each individual verse of scripture um, in the, in the list of all that you got when you did your search on uh, baptism. And, uh, you know, once again, the best way to do that is if you haven't already done it, you just go into your search engine, you uh, type in B-A-P-T-I asterisk or what we would refer to sometimes as a wild card. And then that way it brings up you know, all the various different uh, forms of baptism, baptized, etc., cetera, um, for you. So that you can go through each verse of scripture one by one and then sort out, you know, this whole issue of, well, um, what are we referring to here? What categories would it fall in? And I'm going to break out three categories for us that are important to deal with and then hopefully... Um, you know, you'll be able to appreciate some of the nuances that are there <laughs> and some of the ways in which, you know, it would be for some people a towing cost, which category it should go in. But ultimately, uh, we're going to arrive at, the in general, uh, the same conclusion. Even when we... Um, even when we uh, go and, and cite a bunch of different commentary resources. When, when I look at commentaries, once again, I'm trying my best to get commentaries that I, I could think of as being the most objective in the research. It's hard for a scholar or a theologian to be unbiased um, in the context of his denomination or, you know, his group, but, you know, you can find them. Um, so, you know, even the Dean of Scholars uh, in the Je among the Jesuits, um, Professor Brown, he, he is amazingly unbiased, um, especially at times. <laughs> but I think for the most part, is an amazing scholar who really, uh, and theologian who really um, stands back and, um looks at the scripture objectively rather than just trying to write in the bias of the Roman Catholic Church. And, you know, I, I hope, you know, we would we would want that every uh, scholar and theologian in every denomination would be unbiased and do the same thing. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And I'm hoping that I can teach you to be unbiased and objective, even when it's, you know, something's going on, it really smacks you in the face. And so hopefully I can I can uh, you know, guide you through today uh, what you deal with when all of a sudden there's a verse of scripture that looms up at you and it poses major contradictions in the scripture. And so here we go. So let's just start off with uh, the reality of baptism as you first uh, 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 you know uh, encounter it. And, of course, we dealt with these scriptures already in the topic of dealing with the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. And it's Matthew 3.16, Mark 1.10, 1 
Luke 3.22, John 1.32, which is all about Jesus being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Those are the first things that you're going to deal with. Um, and of course, you know, we have Jesus at, you know, also being baptized in water under John's ministry. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that here in just a little, in a few minutes. So I'm going to defer that till later. Um, and I'm sure you already have those in your list. The next one is Jesus symbolizes death as a baptism. Now, this is really important. Sometimes we look at these categories and we think, ah, you know what? I, I really don't know where to put this in, you know, in the categories as you start summarizing. But I'm just going to leave this out here because I'm sure this is important information for later. Um, or potentially it's important for later. And, and, it, and, and it indeed is. So grabbing a hold of Mark 10, 38 through 39 and also Luke 12, 50, where Jesus is symbolizing his death as a baptism is very important. One of the things that I would do there is I would simply make a note that, ba that baptism can represent death or baptism can symbolize death. Ooh, very important. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out here for you uh, in my summary three categories and the first category that I'm going to have for baptism is baptism in water very important category and um, then the, you know which is primarily the most if you would obvious and evident of all of the categories of baptism and so then the next category that I'm going to lay out here is baptism into the body of Christ this category is a little bit less obvious, um, but it's, it, it's still very important. And I know that in some of these verses of Scripture under that category of baptism into the body of Christ, that people would still argue for baptism in, in, into water. Um, however, uh, hopefully I can make the point as we're going through this lecture of why this category is important to understand that there's actually a baptism into the whole identity of Christ Jesus and what what that category helps us to do uh, when we're dealing specifically um, with some contradictions that are going to arise here. And then um, baptism uh, in the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. So um, one of the things that we're going to get out of here is this, uh, that uh, this is very important, it, it, it is that water baptism is a, is a definite um, command in, in the scripture. And so um, let me go back to baptism in water and, and let's just look at these just real quickly. I said I wasn't going to go through every verse of Scripture, but I do want to emphasize this point um, and, and just refresh your thinking with it. So I'm going to look in, I'm going to look real quickly at Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. And let me just bring my list up. Perhaps you have your list in front of you as well. And that way we don't have to just each time type it in. But the Lord Jesus commands, he says, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Okay, we're going to see that water baptism is, is part of, if you would, those things that are required to do um, with respect to surrendering your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and being a part in every way of the new covenant and you know there's some things that we've got to sort out but at the same time that is always going to be there and the baptismal formula if you would is going to be of course believe repent be baptized in water and receive the gift of the holy ghost now as we've already talked about that baptismal formula can be interrupted because uh, you know, as it was at Cornelius' house, which stands out, is the most radical ex exception to this. Um, uh, but um, once again, usually what you're going to see 
is you're going to see uh, the gospel being preached, a response to the gospel, uh, the word going forth, that response to the gospel is to repent and to believe. And then right after that, just as it took place in Samaria, you're going to have a water baptism ceremony. And then you at that moment in time are certainly a candidate, just like those disciples that um, Paul dealt with in Ephesus, you are now a candidate um, to be uh, baptized in the Holy Ghost, to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Mark uh, 16, 16, again, the Lord Jesus speaking, he says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that does not believe shall be damned. So there, wow, there's once again a more profound, if you would, conjunction of believing and being baptized clearly in water as we see certainly Philip is ministering that very topic in that way to those um, at Samaria. Um, of course, the details of that are fleshed out a little bit better towards the end of the chapter as he's having his dialogue with the Ethiopian, okay? Um, and, of course, we know what's going on in the first part of, of, uh, of the ministry in Samaria, uh, but it's more in a conclusion form. And then, of course, at the end, hopefully that is obvious to you, that dialogue that is going on between uh, Philip and the eunuch, where the eunuch says, well, what prevents me from being baptized? And, of course, we know specifically it is about water because they both go down into the water. Philip's response is nothing so long as you believe with all of your heart. You know, it's really understanding. Look, this is a consecration and a commitment. And so um, let's, let's, let's move on. Um, like I said, I'm not going to go through all the verses of Scripture. I'm just going to hit the highlights here. So then when you walk through all the rest of the verses of Scripture, as you break them out as they relate to water baptism, you know, you're going to have Acts 2.38. Once again, a very important declaration to, uh, you know, the baptism formula or what you might also call or refer to as a salvation formula. Repeat, repent, be baptized. You know, repent, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, be baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, you know, Acts 2.38, um, it really stands out as a high watermark in terms of really emphasizing um, emphasizing this message. I'm going to go over there real quick and just and read it for us. So Acts 2.38, look at it. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I'm, we're going to also come back to this because there are those who then write into this and imply something that um, will ultimately run a contradiction in Scripture. And we're going to pick that up here in just a few minutes. And especially when we're going to ultimately say, say that baptism in water is that which saves you. So we're, we're going to just, we're going to table that for right now. And we'll come back and we'll say, well, does that find contradictions in the scripture? <laughs> and so I promise you it does find contradiction in the scripture. Okay, so then we're going to have to understand how to properly deal with it and not just try to sort it out from one verse of scripture. So once again, um, you know, the salvation formula there in water baptism uh, ultimately finds its, or baptismal formula finds itself, you know, as a central theme, repent, be baptized, specifically referring to water, and then three, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Once again, you can look back and, of course, marry with repent, repent and believe, or believe and repent, either way, because... Um, you know, you can find those occurring in the same way. Logically, if someone's going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ before they're going to repent, they're going to believe the message of the gospel. Somebody's got to be preaching. <laughs> and then at that response to so the authority of the word of God then results in that believe, repent, or repent, believe. However you want to look at that, baptism in water, then gift of the Holy Ghost. Baptism into the body of Christ is something then, is my second category, that, that's really, you know, it's, it's important for us to, to look at it. And um, I think one of the most resounding verses of Scripture on that then is 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and um, verse 11 in our lineup. 
And what we hear, or forgive me, it's not 12, yeah, 11, it's verse 13. The scripture says, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we're Jews or Gentiles, whether we're bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Okay, so here Paul is laying out this, you know, beautiful reality that the church has become, the church is the body of Christ. Jesus Christ is the head of the church and that uh, he now is showing how that we as individuals then, um, as it were, symbolically um, are then immersed into the person Christ Jesus, which, listen, this finds so much evidence and so much support throughout the New Testament concept of salvation. And that begins with, for example, even in communion and the message of communion, the other important, what we would refer to is sacrament, where Jesus says in John 6, 56, to uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood and to partake of my body of the sacrificial offering in reference to a lamb as a lamb and actually going even beyond the prohibitions and restrictions of the Old Testament to pour the blood out upon the altar. Now it's taking the whole of the offering that Christ Jesus gives of himself. And now he's talking to us about in, in the same, really the same thing using a different symbolism. And of course, John six fifty six says he that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I dwell in him. And okay, so now we're looking at a complete immersion into the identity and person, person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't stop there. That oneness is then repeated in John 14. It's repeated, you know, in um, John 15. It's repeated in John 17. Um, that oneness then is, is, is emphasized uh, as we know the Holy Ghost dwells in us. And then we become, you know, uh, that much more aware of this oneness in to some degree as we're now dealing with this baptism into the person the body of Christ is baptism into the church which ultimately finds itself as a, a means of if you would where we now have a unity that otherwise would be impossible a miraculous unity there's so much to say on that and there's really not enough time to do it so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave that there and simply say to you, there's a whole lot more um, verses of scripture on the on the idea of our immersion into Christ, our oneness with him, and, you know, to where that um, our identity is hid away in God. And, of course, I think that one of my favorite verses of scripture, if you know me, is John chapter 15 and, and verse 7. Uh, where the, the, the Lord simply tells us if, the, if we will dwell in him. Wow, that is an immersion. That is a complete loss of identity. Somehow there is a unification that takes place. One, as we, as we refer to, we see it in communion, in a fellowship, an encounter with God, that that truly is what fellowship will bring. Another, we see it with respect to being baptized into this miraculously by the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to make a note here and just simply say to you that, my goodness, truly we need to understand this because it should be something that is happening every time that we join ourselves together in a supernatural event of, of this wonderful uh, you know, thing we call church or the assembly that it that actually there is a place where we ought to be submitting ourselves to the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to bring this miracle of unity that we find ourselves now immersed in the body of Christ and find ourselves so connected as members of the body of Christ that we have this amazing miraculous unity that only God himself can produce in our life that results in a great miraculous outworking of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit given to each one of us. Much more to say on that, but I'm going to leave it to that. I'm going to go back real quickly to John chapter 15 and verse 7 and, and, and say and emphasize this wonderful thing that the Lord has done where he says, now that if we would just simply dwell in God, that is truly a baptism. Okay, if we'll dwell in Christ Jesus, Jesus is saying, if you will dwell in me, 
and you allow my word to dwell in you, then whatever you ask, it will be done for you. Um, an important emphasis on, on fellowship and communion with Christ Jesus that will ultimately result in the, the magnitude of the manifestation of his person, of his glory, and of his power in our midst. We really need to get this. And you're going to have to handle the words some more in order to be able to, to, to appreciate it more. But let's go uh, real quickly and let's look at Romans chapter 6 and, and verse 3 uh, through 4 because this is where, you know, and once again, I'm categorizing this as being baptized into the body, to the person of Jesus Christ and not baptized in water. Um, and so what we, and once again, I am going to back up and say, yes, there is room to understand this as baptism in water. And I can certainly say that baptism in water represents this miraculous event of where we're actually baptized into the person, to the body of Christ Jesus. So, you know, I, I believe that both must be evident here and that both must be considered here. And I truly believe that if we spend more time with all of the surrounding information regarding baptism, that we'll then appreciate that much more why this category is important to us. So verse 3 says, Know ye not that so many of you, as, as so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. And I'm going to say that this is m much the same as 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. It is baptized into the person, baptized into the identity. Does water baptism represent this? Well, of course. But this is something more than water. This is the person. It's not just baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It's baptized into Jesus Christ. We're talking about the person, and someone, you know, will break out certain semantic things there with the Greek language and say, "Well, you know, you know, you're, it's a it's a, a thin thread that you have here when you're just going to base an argument on whether it's baptized in the name of Jesus Christ or or baptized into Jesus Christ." But nonetheless, it is evident. So we're baptized into His death. Okay. Therefore, we are baptized, we are buried with him by baptism into, into death. Understand, I'm, I'm saying that let's go with the exact wording here and let's not, you know, put a word in here. Because the scripture doesn't say, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into water. It's not saying that. So let's not imply that or if you want to imply it, Certainly, you cannot insert the word. Um, and so, uh, once again, we, we recognize that we dealt with the reality that Jesus likened his death unto a baptism. Okay, well, our death is also likened unto a baptism. And we're being baptized into his death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. And we're going to have to emphasize those things that we talked already about in terms of how does salvation come to us? Believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, what is the power of salvation? It's that Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we now being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes or wound we were healed. So the power of of regeneration and the washing of the water of regeneration as Paul's talking about in Titus chapter uh, 3 and verse 5 it, it doesn't have baptism in it it has washing in it and regeneration is certainly a word that also is clearly associated with the new birth or being born again or the miracle of a new creation okay so we we've got to be careful when we're going to go and we're going to you know, insert words into a passage of scripture and derive new meaning from it. We just, we, we can't do that. Uh, we cannot take something like, for example, baptism in water and make baptism in water 
more important than the blood of Jesus Christ, more important than the death, burial, and resurrection, more important than the name. And obviously, if the scripture is saying that, then we want to submit to that. It's just simply not saying that. It's just it, so uh, it's important for me um, here in this situation to just overemphasize that for you. Galatians 3.27, Colossians 2.12, uh, by and large, you know, is, is saying the same thing. Spend more time with it. You can look at the diverse, um, you know, commentaries on this as well. And um, I think that what you will find is that most objective commentaries are simply going to talk about the symbolism of water baptism into his death, even though that they may take these verses of Scripture and they may apply them to the action or activity of water baptism. Ultimately, the conclusion is that the water baptism is going is simply a, you know, a declaration or a symbolism of that we're baptized into the 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 person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that that is ultimately the conclusion, and we are raised up together with Him. Okay, so moving right along here. Um, Let's go on now to discuss baptism in the Holy Ghost. Okay, so the third category is baptism in the Holy Ghost, and it's the ministry of Jesus. We don't really need to spend a lot of time here because we've already gone through this. You know, Matthew 3.11, Mark 1.8, Acts 1.5, Acts 2.4, Acts 8.16, Acts 9.17, Acts 10.47, Acts 11.16, Acts 19.16, all sets the basis for Jesus being the baptizer in the Holy Ghost, it being the promise of the Father, it being the gift of God, it being the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so it's so fundamental in terms of Scripture to recognize that this is something that we clearly see separated out in Acts chapter 8 and that it is um, so paired up with the message of salvation, the gift of salvation, that in reality, there is no reason in Scripture to believe that it should not absolutely accompany everyone's uh, salvation experience of being born again. I'm going to leave that for right now. Much to say there, but I want to go over here to the summary, and I want to start looking at the summary real quickly. Uh, the more common uh, sequence of events that we observe in the New Testament is that people believe and are baptized in water and that afterwards they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the one definite exception is the house uh, uh, of Cornelius in Acts 10.48. Otherwise, you can't really argue with that. And so we're going to take all the things that we've talked about up to this point and we're going to converge them at one point in one summary um, here in um, the next lecture so that we can bring all of our conclusions together, answer all of our questions. Uh, but right now what I want to do is I want to deal with two very interesting verses of Scripture, okay, that seem to pose um, some contradictions. And the first the first one I want to deal with, the, the two verses of Scripture that seem to pose contradictions are 1 Corinthians 1, 13 through 17, okay, and then uh, 1 Peter 3, 21. And I hope that some of you are going, my, I was hoping that <laughs> you would discuss this because it does seem a little bit odd, okay? So when Paul is saying that he wasn't sent to baptize, okay, in water, what on earth is he saying, okay? So let's just look at that uh, real quickly um, in 1 Corinthians 1 and, and, and verse 17. Okay, so he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom. What is he saying? When we've already laid out the reality that baptism in water must most definitely accompany this message of salvation and that when people believe, they're to be baptized in water. Is Paul in any way saying that he doesn't do that? And the answer to that question is, he certainly is not. 
um, baptizian uh, to to be baptized. Um, it could be also um, referred or understood in this particular uh, instance, this Greek word, as a present active infinitive, infinitive, could be understood as to perform baptism. It certainly then helps us with beginning to understand what Paul is saying. Um, and, um, you know, that's why doing word studies in the Greek language has great value, but we don't need to necessarily do a word study to get this. So we don't have to hinge what Paul is actually saying on, you know, the particular usage of the verb in the present active infinitive form and say, oh, what he's referring to is perform baptism. Certainly, um, he is involved in the baptism of water, uh, in bapti being, uh, people being baptized in water. Look at Acts chapter 19. He's not contradicting Acts 19. If he was to say, oh, see, Paul went and preached the gospel and, you know, he didn't emphasize that you needed to be baptized in water, well, then you would be creating a serious contradiction between 1 Corinthians one seventeen and um, Acts chapter 19, uh, for example, in verse, what I believe is verse 6, where, you know, the, the disciples that he was ministering to, he baptized them in water. And after he baptized them in water, and if he didn't do the baptism in water, certainly one of the people that were with him did the baptism in water, one of his assistants, which would be perfectly fine for, and you could actually make some arguments here that, you know, this could be, you know, a an action or an activity of a pastor that is accompanying an, an apostle or other leaders or deacons in the church, potentially. Uh, so, um, you know, the first question we might ask is, does baptism save? Well, no. Paul makes the argument here emphasizing the work of the cross for salvation. That's all he's saying. He's making a point. I am not going to overemphasize water baptism. Look at the context. He's saying, I am not going to make baptism in water the central point. I'm going to make sure that everybody sees something very clearly here and uh, that it's all about the cross of Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to allow anything to be overemphasized or to in any way um, de de uh, distract or demote uh, from the distract from or demote the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. So Paul definitely did not believe that water baptism would wash away anyone's sins. And this is so important. That's what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 1, 13 through verse 17. Look at that. Spend some time with that because, you know, we're getting ready to deal with, you know, another contradiction, as I said, and, 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 and Peter, and we want to really understand, we want to spend some time here looking at 1 Corinthians 1, 13 through 17, understand what Paul is saying and what he's definitely not saying. We don't, once again, one of our rules of hermeneutics is are we creating contradictions with our conclusions? And this is a perfect example. If we were to say that Paul is somehow saying that he doesn't believe in water baptism or that he himself is not baptizing in water or, or that it is not important according to Paul's uh, doctrine, then we would absolutely be creating contradictions and especially contradictions right here in the, in the, in the passage of Scripture that we're referring to in 1 Corinthians 1.13 because he refers to himself personally having baptized Sosthenius and we know that he baptized uh, those uh, disciples um, at um, uh, at uh, Ephesus and we know <laughs> that he himself personally was baptized in water, okay? <laughs> so, um, you know, we're going to... And, and, you know, and once again, we need to deal with that verse of scripture um, as well of when Paul was uh, baptized in water. Because, uh, you know, you, mi you might ultimately conclude that when he was baptized in water, he's also there referring to somehow when he was baptized in water that uh, he was washing away his sins. As some people want to be able to also write into Acts chapter 2 verse 38. 
But once again, if that were the truth, you've got to be able to parse that out. You in 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 once again, if you were to take that message there in Acts chapter nine, you're going to be running into you're going to be creating contradictions, and we and so we want to deal with all of those contradictions. So when we look at what happened with Paul's life himself, we can see that. Um, there in Acts chapter 9 verse 16 and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him speaking of Paul said brother Saul the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto you in the way as you came has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost okay and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight for with and he arose and was baptized okay look He's already had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, he's believed. <laughs> now he's being baptized in water. He's being healed. He's being baptized in water. And when he had received meat, he had straightway, straight, he was strengthened. Then was Saul um, certain days. Okay, well, bottom line of it is we know that so Paul himself is recipient of water baptism, and he's also recipient of baptism in the Holy Ghost because he received his sight and was filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay? And um, immediately there fell scale from his eyes, as we said, and he was baptized in water. So, you know, you could say maybe potentially that Paul actually was an exception in terms of the baptismal formula that he was actually baptized in the Holy Ghost before he was baptized in water, just like Cornelius's house. It could be t potentially, you know, understood that way. I would understand it that way just from a reading of a text, but I'm not going to make a, a big point of it. What I do want to make the, 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 the point of is that we can see in Acts 16 verse 31 when he tells the jailer what he must, be, what he must do to be saved, um, that right after that, um, what happens in Acts chapter um, 16? What happens in Acts chapter 16 He is is he takes the jailer and his household, and what does he do? And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their stripes and what and and they were and they were baptized and was baptized he and all his or his whole house, household immediately. So, you know, Silas could have been doing the water baptism as far as that goes. Paul is just simply emphasizing that the message of salvation that is found in the cross of Jesus Christ cannot be demoted or diminished in for any reason at all. That it takes the supreme position, and you can't argue that. And so, you know, then we have to understand what he said in Acts 22, verse 16, which once again, let me make a side note. I've already referenced these verses of Scripture for you under the category of water baptism. And you can see all the many times that Paul is being involved himself in water baptism um, in terms of actually having received it or ministering water baptism, uh, whether it was himself doing it or whether it was the company of people that was with him doing it. And we could argue that Paul didn't do it just simply as it may be implied from 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 1 that he just didn't want anyone saying that he was baptizing in his own name because, my goodness, is he ever championing the gospel to all of the nations in an almost singular way, okay? Uh, certainly in a very unique way uh, when you re uh, understand that he wrote, um, God used him to write two-thirds of the New Testament. So, in summary, in Acts twenty two sixteen, he's talking about his own salvation experience, and he says, the God of our fathers, beginning in verse 14, he says, the God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know the will, know his will, and see the just one, speaking of Jesus, and should hear his voice of his mouth, for you shall be his witness unto all men of what you have seen and heard, and now, why tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Well, understand, we cannot say that water baptism washes away sins because if we say that water baptism is that which washes away sins, we've just demoted the cross, we've just demoted the blood of Jesus Christ, and not only that, but we've created a huge contradiction of that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin and that whole theme. So you've got to deal with that, okay? We have to come back and we've got to deal with 
any possible contradictions. So we have to understand this in light of what all the scripture is saying. And sometimes in these instances, we've got to go look at the Greek grammar. We've got to look at how many different ways could we actually translate this verse of scripture. Um, and then... Um, and then ultimately find a way in which all of these things can be reconciled. And first and foremost, we would just simply start with Paul himself, because this is Paul talking. It's about Paul's uh, walk with God. It's about uh, Paul's salvation experience. Then, of course, what we do is just as I have done. We back all the way up to... Paul's experience in Acts chapter 9, and we work, walk our way all the way through the things which he himself taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 13 through 17, is really going to have all of us stand back and take another look at this verse of scripture and say, well, he obviously isn't saying that water baptism itself washes away sin. Otherwise, what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 through 17 makes absolutely no sense at all. And then what we can do is once we have moved away from that personal application, now we can understand it in view of the entirety of the New Testament uh, and, and what God is saying specifically about water baptism in respect to calling upon the name of the Lord, and that salvation is in calling upon the name of the Lord, and that the blood of Jesus Christ is what cleanses us from all sin, and then taking it from there. So, um, moving right along uh, in, in the summary here for this, did Paul, did Paul believe in baptism? Certainly he was baptized, he baptized, and he baptized. He was baptized, and he also performed baptisms. Uh, um, that was not the point. Once again, what he was emphasizing was the cross of Christ uh, as the power of salvation and nothing else, okay? Now, number three, Paul places the emphasis on the reality that salvation does not come without first preaching, okay? And very, very important uh, to understand what he's saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 through 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 13 through 17, that emphasis he makes in Romans 10, verses 14 through 15. Also, again, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through, 1 through 2, baptism is only a sequel to the proper response to preaching. Underscore that. Okay, this is what Paul is saying. This is what's being emphasized. This ultimately takes all, all of the uh, contradictions away. Baptism is only a sequel to the proper response to preaching. So, now, let's quickly move on to another, another verse of scripture that seems very uh, contradictory, okay? And that is, uh, and uh, Peter, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, Peter saying, the like figure we're into even baptism does also now save us. Ooh, he's contrasting and comparing uh, what took place uh, in the days of Noah and um, how that the flood came, the water ultimately did away, killed, destroyed everything that was contrary to God. And only, uh, you know, of course, Noah and his eight, um, Noah and his, his wife and his sons and their, and their wives, eight souls were saved. What on earth is being saved here? Baptism now saves us? Well, you can't just stop right there. Uh, we have to ask, uh, you know, we have to read the rest of it. And now, and we also have to deal with uh, the Greek grammar here, okay? Otherwise, we're creating a huge contradiction, okay? He says, but if you continue to read the verse of Scripture, it says, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. And now we're not dealing with the word soma or body, but we're actually dealing with the word sarks, uh, which can be understood sometimes as body or soma, but other times as we're, you know, can re be referred to um, as a, a as a moral state. Um, here, when we say filth, the Greek word is actually dirt, and you could actually then consider it's like washing the dirt off of your body, 
Okay, it's a little bit more than that, but that would be a real simplistic way of understanding this. And he's saying not the putting away the filth of the flesh, which has a tone more of the morality, spiritual morality, but the answering of a good conscience towards God. So he's now emphasizing that ultimately it's a part of obedience, okay, to the gospel message, a, a sequel in the response to the message, okay, as I said earlier, a, 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 a sequel to the proper response to preaching. And because there can be nothing more important than the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and that baptism here then not only once again represents a death, but it also represents a baptism into the body of Christ in Paul, similar to what Paul was saying in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 3, that we're baptized into his death, and that with that is also, because you take that whole pericope, that whole argument that is being placed there, well, instructional in Romans chapter 3, forgive me, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 11, and we see that there's a baptism that into his death, and that there is also the likeness then of his resurrection okay so <laughs> and that's what's being said here look you know number one thing okay jesus went and he was baptized in water okay let's understand how that the remission of sins is also associated with baptism in water and we can see that in john's baptismal ministry in mark chapter 1 and verse 4 we see and understand that john did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Wow, that seems to be bring a whole lot of support to this idea or this notion that water baptism washes away sins or that water baptism in itself saves. But hold on, we would be creating a contradiction if we did that, and we don't want to do that, and we would be creating so many contradictions, you know, with respect to it is the blood of Jesus Christ and the name of Jesus Christ and the person of what Christ, what Jesus did in his person and uh, for us, and so we can't do that. We, we have to make sure that we understand even the contradictions that would be presented as I've already uh, set forth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. Okay, so um, let's look at another one. Acts 2.38 says the same thing, similarly, rather. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Once again, it seems to say that the actual water baptism itself would somehow wash away sins or bring the remission of sins. However, if we lock down on that, once again, we're creating contradictions and, in Scripture, and there's a better way to understand that. Let me, first of all, begin with water baptism with respect to Jesus. Jesus was baptized in water. As we've already mentioned, that's one of the categories, one of the first things that we come to in our categories of dealing with water baptism. Jesus was baptized, okay? Was there any sins to be washed away? No. When Jesus went to John's baptism, what was he doing? He was submitting himself to a ministry. It was, in that instance, a submission and totally symbolic of an immersion into this ministry and into this uh, covenant relationship, if you would, that God had um, provided. But there was no removal of sin on the part of the Lord Jesus. It was a it was an obedience to the ministry that was before him, an obedience to the command of God, because Jesus did exactly what the Father told him to do. So he stood in line with all the rest of the transgressors and sinners. However, he was the Lamb of God who was without sin, who was there to take away the sin. And so water baptism was purpose, it was purely symbolic for him. And, and understand water baptism with respect to that third, that second category. Water baptism of being immersed into the body of Christ, being put into his death, being fully identifying with his death and with his resurrection. 
But the power of salvation is what Jesus did when he died at Calvary's cross. That is absolutely the most important and essential message that you've got to be able to grab here and understand here. So, well, we could, you know, our question once again is, were, were you know, <laughs> were the Samaritans saved? Uh, were they, did they meet all the qualifications of salvation? Well, by the time we're finished here with salvation and what's, what's essential for salvation and what's essential for the new birth, uh, once, once again, does water baptism result in you being born again? Well, you could never say that. Um, water baptism does not cause you to be born again. You are born of the Spirit. Somebody said, well, no, 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 we're born of the water too. Okay, well, I understand that. We're born of the Spirit, we're born of the water. And the new creation and the new creature that is there then presented in this message of salvation isn't something that we understand as water baptism. We understand as a miraculous work of the Holy Ghost who comes and brings forth a new creature. And of course, in that context, water, the washing of the water can under be understood also as, as that which is supplied by the Word of God. And so there are many different aspects of this particular subject that we need to flesh out some more. I've completely run out of time in order to do it. I hope that I have set up for you um, all of the issues that, so that you can more perfectly deal with them. And finally, let me just say this. Simon in Acts chapter 8 is the only exception of the person that wasn't saved. Did he believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah, from all outward evidence. Was he baptized in water? Yes. Was he saved? No. What sorted it out? The gift of God. As soon as the gift of God was being administrated, the gift of the Holy Ghost was being received and being uh, ministered by John and by Peter. It sorted him out. And we can't make salvation a purely ritualistic formula okay it is an action of the holy ghost a miracle of salvation that comes by way of calling upon the name of the lord jesus christ is water baptism an act of obedience should it be a part of the message of salvation and something that every believer should partake of there is no question about that and should it be something that is administered by the local church Certainly, there is a model of that in Scripture. Can anyone who preaches the gospel also, you know, any person who, just any ordinary person, can they administer baptism in water? Certainly. They just need to do it with great reverence and respect, just like Philip did, with an examination, evaluation. Should it be done uh, before witnesses? It should be. There are a lot of things that we haven't talked about here that should be also considered with baptism. But one thing that we want to do is we want to always uh, be challenged by the contradictions and make sure that we find a way in which we understand that contradictions cannot exist. And praise God for 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 13 through 17, because there Paul really truly does clarify for everyone because it's going to be primarily the uh, writings of Paul that people would potentially conclude that somehow water baptism uh, removes sin or washes away sin and we can then come to understand more specifically about what Paul was saying because I know when we're laying out that whole message in Acts chapter 2 verse 38 it just seems to run together and it's all going to happen at the same time. And not to say that, you know, that to, to some degree it couldn't happen all at the same time. But we understand that, once again, usually and in every instance that we find, it's a sequel. And a, a sequel of a proper response to the preaching of the gospel and to the, to the message of the cross of Jesus Christ, the power of salvation. We love all of you. I hope I helped you today. Um, next lecture, we'll try to start helping you understand the commentaries that would be good to consult here and give you a list of some that you can reference and uh, hopefully benefit by.
Lord bless you. We love you.